want you to hit me as hard as you can. Kent Mansley, I work for the government. Hogarth? Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! No? It's the Iron Giant! <clears throat> Hello, and welcome to the first installment of Animation Movies Revisited, where we'll take a look back at some of the greatest animated films and rediscover the reasons they've left a lasting impression throughout the years. In this episode, we'll be deconstructing the nuts and bolts of the Warner Brothers animated classic, The Iron Giant. Directed by Brad Bird in his directorial debut, yes, the same Brad Bird who would go on to helm The Incredibles, Ratatouille, and The Incredibles 2 for Pixar, and Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol for Paramount Pictures. The Iron Giant is based on the 1968 novel The Iron Man by Ted Hughes. As the story goes, Hughes wrote the novel with the intent of crafting a story that would comfort his children after the death of their mother, Sylvia Plath, who died by suicide in 1963 at the age of 30. In her time, Plath had become a world-famous poet, novelist, and short story writer. Her confessional works are still celebrated to this day, but few are aware that her passing would eventually serve as the seed of Hughes's heartfelt story of connection, unwavering friendship, and love. I know you feel bad about the deer, but it's not your fault. Things die. It's part of life. It's bad to kill, but it's not bad to die. Like many other films, the Iron Giant traveled a long and winding road before stomping onto the big screen in 1999. Adapted once before in 1989, it was none other than rock musician and The Who guitarist Pete Townsend who transformed the themes found in Hughes' novel into a concept album titled The Iron Man, The Musical. Released as a 12-track rock opera by the Atlantic record label, Townsend was joined by Roger Daltrey, Deborah Conway, John Lee Hooker, and Nina Simone to help create a sprawling soundscape that explores the unknown and unlikely friendship and the darkness that resides in the hearts of the fearful. Thanks for watching our show. If you like what you see, like this video, click on the bell to receive notifications every time a new one goes up. Now back to the show. In 1991, an animator by the name of Richard Bosley brought the story of the Iron Giant to Don Bluth, the director of such animated classics as An American Tale, All Dogs Go to Heaven, The Land Before Time, and my personal favorite, The Secret of Nim. Bosley had been working at Bluth's studio at the time, and even drafted a story outline complete with character concept art for the pitch. Unfortunately, Bluth wasn't interested, and passed on the idea. Now, before you go shedding any tears for Bosley, you should know that he eventually became the lead animator on Bird's triumphant film. The Iron Giant was something of a Hail Mary for Warner Brothers. The studio was still reeling from the box office failure that was Frederick Duchau's animated Arthurian feature, Quest for Camelot, and the Iron Giant was regarded by many executives as a risky venture. With a worldwide box office total of just $38.1 million earned for Quest for Camelot, Warner Brothers might as well have tossed roughly $40 million in losses to the Lady of the Lake. With the specter of Quest for Camelot looming like a dark cloud, Warner Brothers was forced to reconsider its approach to animation filmmaking. This meant that when it came time for the Iron Giant to roll into production, some significant changes would have to be made, including the use of a smaller budget and a shorter timeline with which to get the film out the door and into theaters. Finally, in 1996, Warner Brothers Entertainment acquired the rights to the Iron Giant, with Bird in line to direct. At that point in his career, Bird had only helmed an episode of Amazing Stories and two episodes of The Simpsons, as well as the classic Simpsons music video for Do the Bartman. The Iron Giant set Bird up for his feature directorial debut, and holy smokes does this man know how to make an entrance. 
Brad Bird's The Iron Giant is set in 1957 during the Cold War in the fictional town of Rockwell, Maine. It follows nine-year-old Hogarth Hughes, voiced by Eli Marenthal, who after investigating a disturbance in the forest behind his house, discovers a 50-foot-tall, metal-munching robot in distress at a nearby electrical substation. Though frightened by the massive mechanical marvel, Hogarth rescues the astonishing automaton, only to discover that the giant is alive and poses no immediate threat. Shortly thereafter, Hogarth and the giant begin meeting in private, but how long can an overexcited kid keep a skyscraper-sized secret before the townsfolk or government get involved? As it turns out, not long. Soon, a series of unfortunate events involving Hogarth and the Giant draw the attention of a manipulative and paranoid government agent named Kent Mansley, voiced by Shooter McGavin himself, Christopher McDonald. Obsessed with stories about Russian spies, visitors from the stars, and giant robots he thinks are programmed to destroy all of humankind, this gaslighting government-appointed official summons a small army to the town of Rockwell with the intent of blowing the Iron Giant to smithereens. Now, with a U.S. Army contingent closing in on their location, Hogarth, a beatnik metalsmith named Dean McCoppin, portrayed by Grammy-winning musician and actor Harry Connick Jr., and the Giant will have to convince a gathering of trigger-happy troops to stand down before one overzealous order obliterates the entire town. The cast also includes Friends star Jennifer Aniston as Hogarth's mother, Annie Hughes, and of course, the Dungeons & Dragons loving action star who lives life one quarter mile at a time, Vin Diesel as the Iron Giant. While actors like Aniston, Connick Jr., and McDonald were able to use their natural voices for their respective roles, Diesel's mellifluous vocals were electronically modulated to give the giant a computerized cadence. According to one of the film's producers, Allison Abate, the filmmakers needed a deep, resonant, and expressive voice to start with. After tinkering with Diesel's now iconic chords, the team settled on the perfect balance between man and machine. As indicated by the production notes for the film, Diesel once remarked that he felt a kinship with the giant, saying the Iron Giant is misunderstood. His strength is the bane of his existence, and despite the fact that he's designed as a killing machine, he is really as simple as a child. I've already said that I feel like a bull in a china shop, and with the giant, he moves to scratch his back and buildings fall. Actually, I think we came from the same planet. While we're on the subject of audio, this is the perfect time to focus on the rousing Annie Award-winning score arranged by composer Michael Kamen. Originally, Brad had organized a temporary score comprised of Bernard Herman cues from 50s and 60s science fiction films, but Kamen was uncertain of this direction. Feeling that an orchestral score would elevate the emotion and action of the movie, Kamen traveled to Eastern Europe in search of inspiration. It was during his visit to Prague that he witnessed Vladimir Ashkenazi conducting the Shea Philharmonic in Strauss's An Alpine Symphony. Cayman was captivated by their sound and eventually arranged for the Shea Philharmonic to perform and record his score for the ambitious animated feature. When it came time to write the script, Bird was joined by screenwriter Tim McAnalyse to transform the 30-year-old British children's book into a rollicking adventure aimed at American audiences. Bird had been impressed with McAnalyse's work on a then-unproduced script for the coming-of-age drama Secondhand Lions, and was excited to work with him on taking Hughes's novel in new directions before bringing it to the big screen. What sort of directions, you ask? How about the inclusion of two of the film's biggest characters, Dean McCoppin and Kent Mansley? That's right. Neither was a part of Hughes's original story, and yet I can't imagine the tale without them. Even the giant's origin story was changed from the original text. Rather than emerging from the ocean like an ancient kaiju whose slumber has been disturbed, Bird and McAnalyse as giant fell from outer space like an ostracized soldier banished from his platoon and sentenced to float among the stars forever. Bird based his contributions to the story on a question he'd asked the executives at Warner Brothers. What if a gun had a soul 
and chose not to be a gun. Together, Bird and McAnalyse combined their ideas to eventually arrive at a place that told a story about the cycle of life and death, but also of bravery and sacrifice. Altering the story to take place in America in 1957 was also an inspired choice by Bird. The setting ties directly into a time when Americans were ordered to introduce duck and cover drills into their daily lives, a safety exercise meant to shield them from the effects of an atom bomb, if only at a significant distance. While the duck and cover method could protect individuals from falling debris, the act of practicing the routine instilled an increased sensation of paranoia among the masses, knowing that a thermonuclear weapon could erase them from existence at any time. The 50s are a wonderful time in which to set this movie, said Bird when talking about the script. America was at a crossroads. We were learning to live with the atom bomb. The space race was just beginning. Paranoia was at a high, and all of this got into the movies of the time. Giant ants and mutated Martian men. That's a pretty funny response to all of those influences. So if you're going to have a story about a human boy who befriends a metal man, it's fitting to put it into the context of the fear that existed at that time. Of course, no analysis of the Iron Giant would be complete without examining the film's animation process. Instead of building the movie entirely out of computer-generated imagery, a la Pixar's Toy Story, the Iron Giant used the classic two-dimensional animation method to create a majority of the film's characters. According to the film's head of animation, Tony Fusili, the animation team created a series of model sheets to serve as blueprints for each character. These sheets featured detailed drawings of every character from every angle while displaying a variety of facial expressions and body positions. This collection of images then served as something akin to a character bible for every animator to study and refer to when creating their assigned scenes. These model sheets were considered invaluable by the team of animators working on the Iron Giant, especially after Bird had given artists entire scenes to animate, as opposed to assigning one animator to a particular character for the entirety of the film. The sheets made sure that the characters were presented on model, and never altered due to an artist's signature style. Imagine having close to 50 animators and 75 cleanup artists working on the same character, without a tool as valuable as the model sheets. That's a madness almost as outrageous as thinking you can hide a 50-foot-tall robot in the rural farmlands of Rockwell, Maine. While the model sheets had given the animators an edge in unifying their technique for animating the film's human characters, they'd quickly discovered that their giant would require a different approach. Therefore, the team used CGI technology to establish the oversized and otherworldly character on screen. By using this method of animation, the animators were able to give the giant a metallic, foreign, and inorganic feel. After some experimentation, the team determined that they didn't have access to all the tools needed to complete the job. Thus, they programmed a series of extensions to their existing software that allowed for things like shading, light adjustment, and alternate patterns that would complete the character's iconic look. Speaking of looks, it was the Rocketeer and Captain America the First Avenger director Joe Johnston who created the first sketches for the giant's design. After a few revisions, the final design was meant to complement the natural splendor of Rockwell, Maine, while also paying homage to the robots across the science fiction spectrum, like Gort from The Day the Earth Stood Still and Robbie the Robot from Forbidden Planet. Another creative who helped realize the giant's final form was artistic coordinator Scott Johnston. With his extensive background in computer graphics, Johnston was regarded by some as a fixer on the set of the Iron Giant. With the swipe of a mouse and an absurd amount of keystrokes, Scott was able to work out the animation kinks that were giving the rest of the team a colossal headache. Thanks to his expertise and creative input, the Giant soon became the Superman fanbot that we've all come to know and love. Atomo! No, Atomo. Tragically, the Iron Giant was labeled a box office failure during its theatrical release. When it came time to assign blame, many pointed a finger squarely at Warner Brothers, saying the studio lacked confidence in the project 
and failed to execute a solid marketing strategy. Unlike Disney animated films that would often have posters on display in cinemas a full year before the film's release, the Iron Giant lacked exposure in the places that mattered most, such as McDonald's Happy Meal tie-ins, action figures on department store shelves, and oversized novelty drinking cups at your local convenience store. Mind you, this lackluster campaign was not a reflection of the film's quality. The Iron Giant performed tremendously during test screenings, which took the studio by surprise. But alas, it was already too late. The Iron Giant had been given a release date that was set in stone, and although the powers that be considered delaying the movie by seven months to ensure a proper marketing push, Warner Brothers decided to roll the dice, hoping that positive word of mouth would translate into dollars in the bank. The Iron Giant opened at Mann's Chinese Theater in Los Angeles on July 31st, 1999. Then in 2,179 theaters across the United States on August 6th. The film debuted at number 9 at the box office, but fell away from the top 10 after only four weeks. By the end of its theatrical run, The Iron Giant earned over $31.3 million in worldwide ticket sales, a total well under the project's reported budget of $50 million. Predictably, analysts blame the studio's poor marketing strategy for The Iron Giant's failure to connect with audiences. In an effort to make up for the loss, Warner Brothers retooled their marketing strategy for The Iron Giant's home release. As a part of the new plan, WB established tie-in deals with the makers of Honey Nut Cheerios, AOL, and General Motors. The studio even went so far as to enlist the aid of three U.S. congressmen to help spread the word about the giant making its way to the home market. Additionally, Warner Brothers provided theater chains with $2 off coupons for the movie to kids attending screenings of the Pokemon movie. When our own Chris Bumbray interviewed Bird in 2015, Chris asked him if he felt like the right people had seen the Iron Giant. Bird replied by saying, absolutely. Then he went on to say that even though the film didn't perform well in theaters, it opened a lot of doors for him in the movie industry. It was very good for me and other people involved, Bird told Bumbray during their time together. I took about 15 people from it with me to Pixar, and one of them ended up taking over Brave to direct it, and another just took over The Good Dinosaur. In revisiting the film, it's no wonder that the Iron Giant has remained an iconic figure among Warner Brothers' vast pantheon of characters. Since his 1999 debut, the Iron Giant has appeared in movies like Steven Spielberg's Ready Player One, as well as the metaverse madness that was Malcolm D. Lee's Space Jam New Legacy. Even Moon Studios, the developers of the Metroidvania video game Ori and the Blind Forest, has said that the Iron Giant and Disney's The Lion King served as inspiration for their award-winning platform adventure game. While a small part of me longs to see a live-action adaptation of this animated classic, I can't help but feel like it should remain untouched. Since the Iron Giant's initial release, a remastered and extended cut of the film, dubbed the Signature Edition, was shown as part of a one-time-only screening across the United States and Canada in 2015. The Signature Edition was then released on DVD, Blu-ray, and digital download in 2016, and included two minutes of additional footage. The Iron Giant, with its world inspired by period artists like Norman Rockwell, Edward Hopper, and N.C. Weth, is in an outstanding animated adventure that I believe will stand the test of time. While animation often invites us into realms of fantasy, The Iron Giant presents a true-to-form 1950s and all the curiosity, optimism, and staunch patriotism that comes with it. The film also serves as a testament to the all-but-retired art of 2D animation, at a time when CGI was steadily becoming the industry standard. The Iron Giant also gives us complex characters to follow, be it a lonely nine-year-old boy searching for companionship after the death of his father, or a work-around-the-clock mom whose only child tugs at her last jangled nerve. Then there's the giant himself, a massive metal man from outer space that's programmed to kill, but ultimately learns the value of life and wants nothing more than to be as powerful and altruistic as Superman. 
I've spoken at length about how touching and imaginative The Iron Giant is, but it's also a film that explodes into an action-packed thrill ride once the giant becomes triggered by what he perceives as violence. The final act of the film is a spectacular display of hybrid animation, as 2D rendered military men launch an all-out assault on a gargantuan CGI golem. I'm giving the Iron Giant 9 Buzz Light Years out of 10, and hope that you've enjoyed this investigation into the inner workings of the animated Marvel that helped put Brad Bird on the map. If I can leave you with one message from this film before we go, it's this. In a world where you can choose to be what you want to be, choose to be like Superman. <laughs>